My name is Peter McPherson. I'm president of APLU. Welcome to our second annual Black History Month celebration, co-hosted here within APLU by our 1890 Council, uh, by our Council of Research and our office, and by our Office of Access and Success. This year, we're pleased to offer the conversations focused on exploring the pivotal role of HBCUs in advancing student success and tackling all these challenges. Over the next 75 minutes, we will hear some of the extraordinary stories about students and research at our nation's public HBCUs. While the focus today is on all these positive, important things, we must acknowledge the wave of bomb threats that to HBCUs in recent weeks. APLU strongly condemns these threats and stands with our HBCU members and other schools to remind everyone that HBCUs and all universities are a place of hope and opportunity. These incidents are scary and infuriating, but they underscore the importance of telling the important stories of our institutions, their students, their faculty, researchers. I want to take a moment to congratulate the 1890 University Foundation on their five-year anniversary. The foundation is led by Dr. Morton Novell, who you'll be hearing from later today, and play an important role in supporting our 1890 universities. And with, it, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Nikita Bell, Associate Director of Finance and Grants Management at APLU, provide an overview and panelist introductions. Nakia. Thanks, Peter. Today's session will include a 10 minute keynote followed by a 45 minute moderated panel and 15 minutes of audience questions and answers. Just a reminder that the chat is disabled. So please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom to enter any questions um, throughout the session. We're thrilled that Dr. Felicia Nave, president of Alcorn State University agreed to moderate this session today. President Nave serves as a member of APLU's Council of 1890s Presidents, earned her PhD in engineering, and as part of an outstanding career has returned to lead her alma mater. Dr. Mort Neufel, President and CEO of, eight, of the 1890 Universities Foundation, has also served as Executive Vice President for APLU, as well as President of both University of Maryland Eastern Shore and Coppin State University. Dr. Willie May, Vice President for Research and Economic Development at Morgan State University is an accomplished chemist who has also served as Director of the National Institute of Standards and Technology and Undersecretary of Commerce for Standards and Technology. Dr. May is a member of APLU's Council on Research. Dr. Paul Jones, President of Fort Valley State University is the current Chair of APLU's Council of 1890s Presidents and has served in a number of senior leadership positions in his career. Dr. Jedida Eisler, Assistant Director of STEM Opportunity and Engagement is an astrophysicist and proud alumni of two HBCUs. We are also very glad that Dr. Eisler has agreed to kick off this session with a brief keynote. Dr. Eisler, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Nakia, for your warm welcome and introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I'd like to especially thank Robin Parent and Howard Godstein from APLU for the invitation uh, and express my extreme excitement to participate with this esteemed group of panelists. Um, who have been longtime champions for HBCUs and educating the nation's best and brightest. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here virtually with you today to talk about these storied institutions, um, what the Biden-Harris administration is doing to support and bolster resources at HBCUs, and to lay out some of the many tough questions that still need answers. Uh, personally, I'm delighted to be here uh, as what I like to call a double HBCU alumna, as Nakia mentioned, of Norfolk State University, Behold, um, and where I received, received my bachelor's in physics, and Fisk University, Go Bulldogs, uh, where I received my master's in physics. So I can say with unwavering confidence that I would not be the person I am today or have reached the professional milestones uh, that I've reached without the foundational skills, talents, confidence, and mentoring I received at uh, those two HBCUs. And while I'm clearly partial to my own story, the impact of HBCUs on the nation is, is undeniable. 
uh, while HBCUs share in common their collective founding in the face of discrimination, they have a proud history and legacy of achievement. Uh, President Biden noted in his remarks at South Carolina State, where I did a NASA funded research internship, uh, that HBCUs graduate graduate leaders in every field and include barrier breaking doctors, business owners, scientists, artists, lawyers, engineers, educators, and many of whom are public servants. Uh, several HBCU graduates in senior roles in the Biden-Harris administration, including uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, the first HBCU graduate ever to serve as vice president, as well as director of the White House Office of Public Engagement, Cedric Richmond, and the Environmental Protection Agency Administrator, Michael Reagan. This is both a point of pride and a reaffirmation of the continued relevance and necessity of HBCUs to the science and technology ecosystem. Yet despite this record of success, disparities in resources and opportunities for HBCUs and their students persist. And the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted new and continuing challenges uh, for HBCUs. Uh, since January 2021, the Biden-Harris administration has delivered a historic $5.8 billion cumulative investment in and support for HBCUs, which includes the President's American Rescue Plan uh, and other pandemic relief that has provided nearly $3.7 billion in relief to HBCUs in 20, 2021 alone. Um, these emergency grants were funded uh, funded directly to HBCUs uh, from, their, from the Department of Education of help HBCUs and their students mitigate the negative impact of the pandemic on students' educational attainment. They've helped institutions support student stability, uh, students' ability to make, meet basic needs, uh, target resources to students uh, with the greatest needs, support campus operations, staffing, teaching, and educational programs, uh, and keep command, campus communities safe uh, by preventing and mitigating the spread of COVID-19. There's also debt relief. The Department of Education has discharged uh, approximately $1.6 billion of debt from loans uh, provided to HBCUs for capital improvements uh, through the HBCU Capital Financing Program. Uh, the actions resulted in debt relief to 45 HBCUs, 13 public and 32 private institutions um, in 2021, which enables uh, these institutions to focus resources on supporting the students, um, the faculty and the staff um, while we're all recovering. In July 2021, uh, Ed awarded nearly $500 million in grant funding to HBCUs for academic capacity building uh, and fiscal stability. So HBCUs and, and MSIs more broadly enroll a substantial fraction of underrepresented uh, minoritized, minoritized undergraduates and are responsible for preparing a significant number of students of color in science and engineering. Across all HBCU institutions, the numbers of science and engineering bachelor's degrees earned by Black students are increasing. Um, in 2018, uh, science and engineering fields accounted for nearly 32% of the bachelor's degrees uh, Black students earned at HBCUs. So MSIs and HBCUs play an important role in training underrepresented students uh, for doctoral study in science and engineering fields. A considerable share, I know this comes as a surprise to no one on this call, but a considerable share of Black science and engineering doctoral recipients receive their bachelor's degrees uh, from an HBCU. Around 25% of Black science and engineering doctoral recipients between 2015 and 2019 earned a bachelor's degree from HBCUs, so nearly a quarter. Um, and of the 10 top 10 baccalaureate institutions of doctorates in the National Sciences and Engineering, seven of them are HBCUs. Uh, the top spot in that category is North Carolina A&T, uh, which I'll come back to in a second, but it includes Howard, uh, FAMU, Spelman, Xavier, Morgan State, and Jackson State. Um, non -HBCUs, the non-HBCUs that um, round out that top 10 are um, UMBC, University of Maryland College Park, and uh, the University of Florida. So despite the incredibly significant contribution to the science and engineering field, science and engineering support uh, to HBCUs lag behind increases in other institutions um, as of the 2019 um, NCSCS data. Uh, the total federal obligations for science and engineering to HBCUs in FY 2019 constitute 0.9% of all federal obligations to all institutions of higher education in science and engineering. 
This mismatch in federal support and compare, compared to the outsized impact of HBCUs on the science and engineering talent pool cannot be understated. Um, and going back to that number one HBCU on the list, North Carolina a and um, it's also the primary HBCU recipient of science and engineering obligation, federal science and engineering obligations since 2019. Um, so combined, the federal R&D uh, funding makes a huge difference in providing state-of-the-art science and engineering training and combined with the world-class mentoring and training um, that all, uh, all HBCUs provide, um, all HBUs could thrive. So on this last point and relating to the set of experiences and structural considerations that lead to student success in a healthy science and technology ecosystem, uh, we turn to the insight that OSDP received um, from our groundbreaking series, the Time Is Now um, initiative, which was and is an ongoing effort to advance equity in science and technology. And um, so last summer, we began this roundtable of candid and robust conversations with researchers, thought leaders, and advocates on themes related to science and technology equity broadly defined to gather feedback that can assist OSTP in assuring that our SNT ecosystem is preeminent, equitable, and inclusive. We talk to researchers, thought leaders, advocates, and ask for feedback to diagnose these endemic issues and suggest informed and evidence-based solutions to assure that all can thrive in these fields. But our effort didn't stop there and is ongoing. At the end of last year, we um, developed an ideation challenge, a public ideation challenge, during which we sought insights, examples, best practices from all over the American public to regarding how we can guarantee that Americans can fully participate in con and contribute to the science and technology ecosystem especially those communities that have been historically excluded from STEM education opportunities, including Black, Latino, Indigenous, and Native American persons, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer persons, persons with disabilities, um, persons who live in rural areas, and persons otherwise adversely affected by persistent poverty or inequality. We continue to be in dialogue with stakeholders in education, government, business, philanthropy, and civil society about the strategies and practices for advancing equity. Uh, just, I can't, I don't know what today is. Just a few weeks ago on February 11th, we co-hosted an event with the Smithsonian called Water Unites Us, a celebration of women and girls in science and Black History Month. Um, and later this year, we'll introduce a national STEM equity strategy, which will be informed by all of these engagements um, to galvanize multi-sector collaborative effort to make STEM from biomedical laboratory to tech sector, skilled technical workforce, um, to advanced manufacturing sectors, proactively inclusive and intentionally designed to be places for thriving for all Americans. Uh, with transparency in our, aim, our aims, honestly about our past and measurable accountability for our future. So with those things in mind as part of the um, scaffolding of this conversation, I really look forward to being in dialogue with uh, you all today. So back over to you, Nakia. Okay, thank you. Um, now I'll turn it over to Dr. Felicia Nave, who's going to um, be moderating our panel. Dr. Nave. Thank you, Nakia, and thank you, Jedida, for an excellent keynote and setting the tone for today's conversation. I also want to thank Peter uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity uh, to have a conversation and dialogue about our HBCUs, the contributions, particularly here in uh, Black History Month. It's a pleasure to be uh, moderating such an esteemed panel of my colleagues, and I know we will carry uh, bring forth a rich dialogue about HBCUs. Uh, so we'll get started. Mark, um, taking on this first question, HBCUs have a long history of supporting students in STEM. What are a few key points of that history that highlighted the legacy that has led to us to the present value and importance of HBCUs today? Thanks, Alicia, for that question, and um, thanks, Jadida, for that really impressive opening remarks. And um, let me be 
selfish and say long before STEM was popular in a buzz work, there was Tuskegee Institute at the time with Booker T. Washington and, and others. So as those of us in this industry think about STEM, we sometimes like to say it's really STEAM mm -hmm. because the foundation of many of our STEM initiatives came out of the agricultural enterprise. I will say that as my, as my opening comment. <laughs> um, as you rightly mentioned, since the 90s and before, HBCUs have demonstrated and documented in various publications their successes in training and graduating minorities in science, engineering, and related disciplines at a comparatively higher level than TWIs. Our successes can be attributed to our willingness to attract and accept at risk and sometimes underprepared young men and women and provide them with financial support, create the appropriate learning environment to excel and yield successes, design programs such as Saturday Academies, create STEM pipeline programs, having a more deliberate and intentional student advising and mentoring process, exploring business and industry partnerships for industry, for internships, building more living learning facilities and having more intentional career development pathways. Along with accepting and preparing and graduating and placing our students as is as our mission as we move forward. So those are some of the comments I will start with Felicia and thanks for the question. Thank you. I, I identify quite readily. Um, Alcorn is celebrating 150 years of existence uh, as a 1890, a primary agriculture school. And I myself am a STEM graduate from Alcorn State University. So I know firsthand uh, the significance and importance of a degree, uh, in particular a STEM degree from an HBCU, the uh, economic uplift uh, that it provides for our community, the diversity that we offer uh, in these innovations and technologies that have helped to advance our respective areas, our state uh, and the nation, which is evidenced by uh, the statistics that J Jediah mentioned, articulated in her opening comments. And so it goes without saying HBCUs, uh, our 1890 institutions have played a major and significant role in making sure that the STEM workforce continues to advance and our country continues uh, to be a leader in that area. Now, Paul, turning to you, we know that along with successes and opportunities, there are also challenges. What are some of the current challenges that HBCUs are facing in STEM? Thank you, Felicia, for that question. And, you know, it, it really comes down to um, one particular area, but there are many things. And I think it's the funding uh, challenges that we face as, as HBCUs in general. You know, the data is real clear, and I think Jediah did an excellent job of really helping us to understand uh, the impact that HBCUs have made in the area of STEM. But this critical funding, there's this disparate funding that exists between our institutions, um, uh, between the HBCUs and, and traditional, uh, let's say, white institutions. And this, this critical funding, particularly in the area uh, of infrastructure needs. Uh, we, we need desperately those, those funding. We're doing a lot with a little. Mm -hmm. And you know, imagine um, the impact we can make if we figured out a way to level the playing field in terms of funding support coming into our institutions. This funding infra, uh, infrastructure we're talking about is not only at the research level, but uh, for educational and retaining uh, qualified faculty members uh, and having competitive salaries so that um, we can continue to thrive um, as institutions. Um, I, I would also say that an area that's a challenge for many of our institutions and ours included is, um, you know, funding needs to uh, help in, in this infrastructure area, but, but bring about the technical uh, technical support that's needed 
for our institutions. Um, we don't often have uh, uh, the level of support to help in the grantsmanship area um, and, and other, other, other areas that, um, similar to that. And so it just, for me, it boils down to um, much needed uh, funding support um, that is needed in our HBCUs. Absolutely, Paul. Uh, you said it perfectly in terms of the infrastructure uh, to be able to retain and uh, to attract and retain uh, the faculty who will conduct the high quality research, having the facilities, but having the support infrastructure to make sure that that takes place, along with having the programs that are attractive and, and truly push the cutting edge. So uh, Jediah, you mentioned you are a two-time HBCU grad. Um, in, 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 you know, add to us to the conversation with regard to how the history and legacy is impacting student choice. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I am just already so excited about the comments that my colleagues have made and really want to underscore them, you know, in terms of what a healthy development process looks like in terms of infrastructure research supports. Just want to underscore that. And, you know, like I said, being a graduate of both Norfolk State and Fisk are, were key parts to my intellectual development and my development as a human being. I think hearkening back to some of the comments Mort made that, like, the power for HBCUs for me personally, and I suspect for generations before me, is that HBCUs invest in one as a human first, and then as a partner in the development as an intellectual. And you know that's sort of a matter of fact thing we say as a throwaway statement in 2022. But considering the historical context of HBCUs, uh, that and being born as a black woman in America, right? Like that that's actually a radical notion, um, and I think that is a part of the educational experience and the benefit of HBCUs to be treated with dignity and respect, which was at the time and a radical idea. Um, so I think student choice is cr critical in all of this because the, the understanding the tension and challenge of supporting HBCUs should not be misconstrued with not choosing HBCUs, right? Because there are so many benefits that come from it. So I think, you know, the fact that this that student um, enrollment in HBCUs is increasing, particularly in STEM fields, is a good sign to show that uh, students are still interested in receiving this kind of particular education. I think it's a reaffirmation of the expertise that various HBCUs in various very different mission-driven ways are pushing forward in advancement. So, you know, I think the, the two ways that I answer are one from a personal perspective that, you know, for me, it was an important choice, but also from the perspective that there's so much that comes with uh, an education from an HBCU that we want to make sure that students are given the best multifaceted set of options as they're choosing uh, these institutions, which have demonstrated success repeatedly. Oh, absolutely. So let's... Um... Uh, Paul, you start us down the infrastructure uh, conversation, so let's turn a bit to policy for infrastructure and partnerships. And, and I'm going to read this question to you and want you to uh, share with us your thoughts. Both Congress and the administration have put forth proposals to invest in infrastructure at HBCUs. We are pleased to see that that le legislation, APLU, proposed to support research capacity building for HBCUs and MSIs at the National Science Foundation was included in the American Competes Act that just passed the House a few weeks ago. Unfortunately, nothing has been funded yet. If funded, how do you see increased federal support for infrastructure and research capacity building impacting HBCUs? And how could these investments impact su student success at both undergraduate and graduate levels? Yeah, and you know, and I think that, you know, this is significant. And uh, first of all, you know, we want to applaud uh, some of our congressional leaders and Alma Adams and, and others who have taken the lead in, in this area. And of course, the, the president's Build Back Better uh, legislation. But, you know, I think that this is important uh, to our institutions in terms of this, these kinds of investments that are needed for infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, I, I said earlier that, you know, ima imagine if, if we were able to somehow level the playing field 
um, and, 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 and be able to invest more in our institutions, we could increase the, uh, make sure we have the, the adequate research facilities that we need. Uh, certainly we need, many of them need to be renovated, uh, new equipment. Um, um, this translates to, um, uh, you know, really ensuring that our faculty and student uh, are, are, have the best uh, uh, technology in front of them, the, the facilities in, in that, that they will have. And, and quite frankly, I, I think that if we're able to make these important investments, we will see tremendous success um, with our, well, I would should say uh, expanded success in, in, in these, these areas. We're making some important investments right now, you know, in the area of, of innovation, and um, we we know that uh, that in 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 moving this moving the needle forward in this area, we anticipate that that uh, uh, is going to help us with recruitment uh, of, of students at the undergraduate and graduate levels. Uh, mm -hmm. It will allow us to uh, re uh, recruit uh, more. Um, uh, qualified faculty members in these areas. And therefore we believe that uh, it, it, it will uh, allow us to enhance our student success and therefore grow our enrollments that are important uh, in these areas. So this is a very important uh, question and it's one that I think all of us uh, are really uh, anxious to see this, this legislation move forward. It's gotten out of the house, but uh, uh, some important steps to, to move forward. Absolutely, funding is key, I, and I concur in thanking all the work uh, that Congresswoman Emma Adams has done, Congressman David Scott, and my own uh, Mississippi Congressman Benny Thompson to help us move the agenda uh, for HBCUs. And, and likewise, it's in the our students are often the most marginalized and don't have the resources uh, that many other students do. So the scholarships, the fellowships, the internships uh, that often lead to the corporate partnerships. Uh, as we continue to advance the innovation and having the spaces, whether that's renovated spaces or building new facilities for our faculty, staff, and students to be able to cut, uh, conduct that cutting edge research. Uh, Mark, we hear a lot about the power of partnerships in higher education. Can you share how partnerships have helped or are helping support HBCUs relative to innovative collaboration and in industry research? Thank you, Felicia. And, um, before answering that question, let me pick up on the previous conversation. Oh, absolutely. And our dependence on federal support and the challenges that can accrue because of the cyclic funding from the federal government. Mm -hmm. And what um, our HBCUs are lacking is um, sustainability. Mm -hmm. And we are not blessed with the foundations um, with the investments so that we can rely on these investments while waiting on the federal appropriations process. Mm -hmm. So that infrastructure is critical in whatever we do. And COVID has really been a learning experience for us. For us. And through COVID, we have learned really the problems that we face in terms of infrastructure development, including broadband technology. And what we are finding out is, as we have been left behind in the past, so we are being left behind because of our lack of technology to reach those communities that we serve by being unable to really extend the campus to meet their needs. So in response to your, your specific response to your question, um, the foundation has formed significant partnerships with um, Microsoft, which in addition to investing over $1.2 million in support for a range of technology projects to benefit the 1890s, Microsoft re recently introduced the 1890s to UIDP, which is University Industry Partnerships, which is reaching out to HBCUs to bring major companies across industry sectors together with the HBCUs to partner on academic research initiatives. We have a delegation of 1890 deans and researchers 
along with foundation staff attending the UIDP's HBCU industry forum later in March. And our foundation chair, Dr. Paul Jones from Fort Valley State University here on the panel with us, will be participating as a speaker at UIDP's um, HBCU forum, which we are confident will yield results in the form of partnerships between 1890s and various private sector companies. And we hope that these results will be tangible. Walmart is also part leveraging our centers of excellence throughout the 1890 community. They are looking at strate strategic port program partnerships, which will expand through, throughout their reach and market share, which can contribute to their overall um, growth throughout the communities that we serve. And we do hope that through this, these partnerships, we can contribute and build our infrastructure so that we can be of greater support to the 1890 communities. Partnership is a critical part of what we do, both from the private sector and with USDA. Absolutely. So Paul, can you talk about uh, partnerships with our uh, predominantly white institutions? Yeah, but let me let me add on to uh, more comments. You know, I, I, I you know, the, the federal support is great, and 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 we need to see that that support expanded. But uh, enhancing our, our our partnerships with industry is very important, mm -hmm. and and that's something that I think all of us uh, are doing. And particularly these last couple of years, uh, we've seen a substantial increase in uh, new partnerships with, with our industry partners. And, and um, I, I, I'll speak to some of that potentially later. But in terms of with our, our higher, ed, higher ed partners, that, that too is important. Um, you know, an example of that for our institution, for example, was the kind of partnerships that we've had over the years with our cooperative development energy program that's been around since uh, about 1993, I believe it is. And that partnership is with several uh, R1 uh, institutions or those traditionally white institutions and is aimed at increasing the number of women and minorities in uh, engineering and in the industry, uh, energy industry. Uh, institutions like Georgia Tech and Penn State, UT Austin, um, to name just a couple, University of Arkansas, UNLV, and these, these are really important uh, partnerships because as part of that, we have an academy and for ninth through 12th graders. So building that pipeline and then a university um, uh, 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 program as well. But in the, uh, with the institutional uh, or academy, we uh, are able to uh, bring ninth graders, uh, beginning at the ninth grader into this academy. And every year those students are going to our partner institutions um, for research during the summers. And so those kinds of uh, uh, programs or initiatives are, are, are very important. A new one that we just, uh, uh, we, we just uh, launched is with our 1862 partner, Utah State University, as well as uh, one of my alma maters. And it's a partnership bringing the two land grant institutions together to bring about um, the kinds of collaborative uh, co collaboration that would, in, would support both campuses. And so we took a team out to their institutions. We're looking at uh, partnerships uh, with in, uh, undergraduate research, uh, 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 internship opportunities, faculty collaborations. And, and quite frankly, this is the direction. I don't think we can sit on, um, on this island much longer if we want to thrive as, as institutions, these kinds of, uh, of partnerships with our uh, traditionally white campuses is, are very, very important. And so I, I, I see this as part of that pathway forward. And that's just a couple of examples of what we are doing um, in this space. And I, I think it's, it's something that we need to continue to expand. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I concur. I think a number of our HBCUs are looking for those broader partnerships, uh, both with industry, with our PWI 
uh, higher ed institutional partners, but also with each other. It's an opportunity for us to uh, truly uh, support each other and, and grow um, what our capacities are, uh, just looking at where those natural synergies uh, lie. Um, Jadaya. Gotcha. Where do you see the partnerships fit with the context of OSTP's conversation? Yeah, it's, this is just such a rich dialogue. Um, and, you know, I wanted to underscore, I of course can't comment on proposed legislation, but I just wanted to underscore some of the, the, the themes I heard about, you know, the infrastructure needs and sustainability needs and how uh, those are both distinct by institution um, and what their needs are and also uh, sort of overarching in the, the sustainability needs. Those, those are all really important points. Turning to the question um, that you were asking about how OSDP thinks of partnership, you know, the first thing I'll talk about is our that, you know, partnerships within and outside of government are critical parts of the work of OSDP. In particular, right, as, as the Office of Science and Technology Policy, we, you know, as we're executive office of the president, we're responsible for looking across the federal landscape um, and finding and cultivating relationships with federal agencies that benefit uh, all, of the, all of America, which include uh, HBCUs, um, but also outside of government to make sure that we're reaching um, and connecting in the ways that uh, really will support the country's economic benefit and preeminence. And I think, you know, this is all the approach that President Biden has taken since day one. In fact, he asked uh, his science and tech team um, to answer less, to answer the questions about lessons we could learn from the pandemic to something Mort said earlier, or how science can help us avert climate disaster, right? Like how we can stay on the leading edge of technological development while propelling new industries and new jobs, right? The same conversation that we're talking about here and to make sure that the benefits of science and technology reach every American. And, and that's what we're working to answer the call for um, and to, I think it was Paul that just mentioned it, it just can't be done in one direction. Or Felicia, I'm sorry, I think it, it might've been you that said it. Like it, it's, not, it's not one front, we have to do it in a number of different um, arenas. For OSTP, like, like I was mentioning earlier, that happened a lot in our discussion with um, st different stakeholders through our Time Is Now initiative and a number of um, convenings around our tech equity work, et cetera, et cetera. We are in conversation uh, with folks to understand where we can best support uh, the work that's happening. And not just that, but to take it from hearing what needs to be done to actually doing it. So for uh, OSTP is in development right now of our national STEM equity strategy, um, which will be informed by all of these conversations. So, you know, we got feedback in from the public. Uh, we are reading and analyzing it. We are, as you know, an evidence-based um, administration. So we're taking in that data, um, analyzing it, and pulling out the threads and best practices um, that will allow uh, us to build a strategy that helps the, the entire ecosystem thrive. And I'll just point specifically to why we've been thinking about this work in the context of an ecosystem. And it's because of the things that we mentioned, right? That there need to be multiple nodes, bridges, and on-ramps between uh, and across organizations, institution types, and levels uh, to make sure that we are growing in a way that supports the, these institutions in particular um, that are the purpose of this conversation, um, but also um, the forward movement of the country. So such a strategy requires partnership and cooperation uh, to succeed. And um, President Biden has also said that he wishes for the US government to be a model employer um, that provides diverse, inclusive, equitable, and accessible workplace. Um, but in order for that to really have a hold, we have to have commitment from external stakeholders that they are also going to maintain the same uh, commitments, private industry, institutions of higher education, decision makers across the country. We all have to commit our resources, organizations, success metrics to the same set of guiding principles uh, to get to these goals that we are all after. So, you know, if we're going to substantively, sub substantively and decisively uh, move this nation towards a more just and equitable society and STEM ecosystem, then partnership is not optional. It's required um, to, to bring people and organizations across the line. So, you know, there are many specific examples I could give, but from the perspective of this office, we view that as being core uh, to the work that we do in building coalition and producing these more equitable outcomes. 
That's excellent. And I commend the Biden administration for acknowledging in their commitment to diversity, and inclusion, and an understanding in order to propel that next generation of innovation in STEM and technology. It requires having us all at the table and recognizing our strengths. And I do appreciate what you said, Jediah, about it's not a one size fit all strategy. Uh, each institute is taking the strengths of each uh, collaborator and, and really building on that to make sure that you continue to make the significant contributions, which takes us over into measuring success. Measuring success is incredibly important in understanding how initiatives are making a difference. How do you measure and track success in supporting a more diverse STEM workforce in your area? And can you share some examples of recent successes? And I kick it back to you, Jediah, to, to start us off with this, this segment of the conversation. How's, sure. the, how's the government measuring success? Sure thing. You know, it's this is <laughs> it's such a timely conversation, you know, and I, I keep sort of underscoring places where we're trying to move towards these these same um, impetuses. And the one that comes to mind is the Equitable Data uh, Working Group that uh, was established by executive order to make sure that we are, in fact, an evidence-based decision and poli policy-making administration. Uh, that work continues. There will be a report coming out soon about how we can make um, federal data, including things like NCSCS, NSB reports, uh, census, you know, all of the ways that the government collects data, more equitable and more inclusive and really quite frankly more intersectional so that we get a representation of what we uh, uh, need to know. But, you know, as we talked about earlier, HBCUs have a long history of supporting a vibrant STEM workforce. And, you know, according to uh, the National Association for, Association for Equal Opportunity in Higher Education, this is one of my favorite stats, I say it as, as often as I can. And while HBCUs make up only 3% of the American institutions of higher education, they serve more than a fifth of African-American college students. Um, that's an outsized impact. Uh, we already talked about the fact that seven of the 10 baccalaureate institutions for black doctorates are HBCUs. Um, and so in some ways, we have a lot of success metrics already, right? We have them listed, they are critical in STEM. Um, the issue comes in how do we take success metrics that are both demonstrated and that could be amplified through um, uh, strategic implementation of removing, say, for example, to Paul's point, disparate uh, funding uh, concerns. How do we make sure that those d disparities in our defunding, for example, are met? What are the success metrics there? How do we measure progress there? And um, so that we are providing necessary training to the best and brightest. You know, these are the tough questions um, that I hoped we would get into and that I hope we can continue to push forward in. Um, and with the leadership of Dr. Tony Allen, president of Delaware State, uh, and Dr. Glenda Baskin Glover, president of TSU, uh, the chair and vice chair of the president's board of advisors on HBCUs, we hope to see STEM centered in those conversations of ongoing work to support and engage key stakeholders in education, business, and philanthropy to get those um, partnerships we talked about earlier uh, focused also on STEM. You know, I think we have to keep that singular. I mean, I'm biased. I'm at the Office of Science and Technology <laughs> Policy, but you know, we, we do have to keep STEM into in the center of that conversation. So I think. You know, this administration has demonstrated a commitment to evidence-based policymaking and supporting the economic benefit um, and equitable advancement of all America. Um, so the hope is that we can match the demonstrated success with the known benefit of adequate fiscal resource um, to drive the innovation and discovery that we were just talking about. So um, that, that's sort of where I am with that. Happy to talk a little bit more. Excellent. Mark? <laughs> Measurement has been a difficult subject for us over the years, and we have countered the question by um, advocating for defining our starting point and then determining our end point and looking at the parameters in between. Mm -hmm. What are you putting in um, position to move from that starting point to the end point? And that's where the dilemma is. 
And HBCUs have been really famous for taking what quote unquote the least of these and ensuring that they reach an acceptable level of performance and can matriculate um, into graduate programs, et cetera. So it's gonna be a continuing discussion on how we measure success. Very good. And Paul, can you talk with us about you know, what they've shared, but also on the leadership side? Sure, and you know, I think that you know, it is very important for us to, to be very strategic and to have real measurable goals in this space. Um, I don't think it's enough to just simply say, we want to do better in STEM, if you will, mm -hmm. um, but rather have some concrete goals as we're leveraging our uh, recently uh, uh, launched strategic plan to help guide us and, and to have some real uh, goals and, and make real investments. Um, I think it's important for us to, if we're going to uh, enhance the workforce, then, then we have to have clear goals around uh, uh, tracking the number of students that uh, are earning STEM degrees. Uh, uh, we should be measuring uh, our you know, grants and contracts in these, in these areas. Um, students look going into uh, professional programs, uh, um, students who are taking advantage of undergraduate research or those high impact areas, all of those things I think are important and will have a direct impact on what happens in the workforce later. Um, but again, these goals have to be um, very clear. And, um, and, and, I, and I know that firsthand, the importance of making sure that we, uh, we, we provide uh, clear goals, and we also, for, you know, as, as president, it's important for uh, me to continue uh, to be messaging around these things. Um, but also, I think the real challenge we have at uh, many of our HBCUs, not all, but institutions like myself, uh, like uh, our institution, rather, is our inability to tell our stories. Um, uh, we do a great job in a number of the, the areas, uh, but we're not often telling the story. Um, and these important stories are incredible stories. Um, the statistics that have been shared uh, over and over by Jediah and, and, and others, um, it's not just by chance that we've had some of these successes. And so we have to do a better job of telling our story and the impact that we're making in STEM, and um, uh, that's something that we're, we're committing ourselves to doing a better job of because we are making good strides. There have been recent successes, an uptick in the in in the number of uh, 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 African Americans, in particular, going into these fields. But again, uh, those stories have to be told so that more and more of our students um, are hearing those stories, that uh, more of our partner institutions are hearing those story stories, our industry leaders. And so that's something that I think is really important for us. And we, we have to document it mm -hmm. and then tell everyone about it. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Uh, you know, we have a rich history, long legacy, strong stories uh, to tell. I think that gets us to that capacity and infrastructure. Um, um, aspect of where, you know, we the opportunity for us to grow and where those resources and support uh, will really help us be able to articulate in a broad and comprehensive way of just the exceptional talent that has come through and continues uh, to be educated by uh, HBCUs. And so, you know, I, I, you, you, have to, you have to measure, um, but we have to contextualize uh, those measurements to make sure um, that we're not comparing um, apples to oranges. Um, and to your point about we, um, we outside, uh, we outsize our impact. Uh, there may there needs to be greater investments because of the historical lack of investments in order to uh, truly move our institutions forward. We we have the know how, 
Uh, we've demonstrated the ability. Uh, and so we are a, a good investment because there has been a return uh, on the investment. We have a little time before we get to questions. Um, I know Jadai, you mentioned you had some other comments, but on any of the three topics we mentioned, if any panelists uh, have any additional comments they'd like to add before we turn to the questions? Let me comment on the university to university partnership. Um, one of the best examples from my perspective was the Title 12 legislation on international development, which partners, partnered 1890 universities with 1862 universities. And those um, partnerships were very, very critical, important, and really enabled us to establish international development offices, offices which were very, very successful. And the, uh, initially, many of these univer the 89 universities were not actively engaged in international development, but because of the partnerships and because of the funding that came down from that Title XII legislation, we were very, very successful. However, things fell by the wayside when the funding stopped, as, as happened with many of the initiatives that are not sustainable. But how the partnership was framed was a really successful way of linking um, HBCUs, 1890s in particular, with 1862 universities. Anyone else? I'll jump in here on that, um, gonna pivot back to that measuring success point, because I think the point you were making, Felicia, about, uh, and Paul, about telling the story uh, is one that when we're thinking about what equitable data looks like is a similar question, right? That um, the, we do need metrics. You, you've got to measure deltas on curves, et cetera, but there is qualitative data that will also inform um, and should inform decision-making and policy-making and we have to do a better job at collecting that that information as well, which I think is another way of saying tell uh, tell the story. Um, and it's it's a it's a question I think you know for the equitable data working group and the report that they're going to put out. It's it's the first attempt at at making some changes on a broader scope of conversations. But I think making a statement from the federal government about how we can start to think about building equitable data by more robustly characterizing um, a number of these different arenas. So I, I think we would do ourselves a disservice if we tried to reduce it down to delta X over delta T. Um, but we do have to find what um, appropriate and reasonable measures do allow for a holistic view of, of the story. And, and maybe the, the second thing I'll say uh, is, is back to the point about some of the things we heard at the Time Is Now roundtables uh, about, you know, not only the like structural supports that mission-driven institutions like HBCUs, like TCUs, et cetera, um, are exemplary at, um, but also, and I think Mort mentioned this very early on in this conversation, also the, the necessary financial support for students who are more likely to be um, in need of such support, not all, but uh, uh, more likely. And so I think thinking about how those are also metrics that may not seem apparent um, in a conversation about measuring success, but really truly are, it's just a different variable um, because of the context of, of, of the population. Paul, did you have anything else? Any additional comments? Nothing at this time. Okay, very good. So we have our first question. Is there anything the cost study at UD can do to help provide benchmarks for the cost of instruction, research expenses, and faculty workload expectations at the program level? Maybe looking at HBCUs versus PWIs. How can we help more HBCU institutions participate in the cost study so that we can better tell this data story? And for those who are not familiar, the cost study is a discipline level comparative analysis of faculty teaching loads, direct instructional costs, and separately budgeted scholarly activity. Since 1995, the study has allowed four-year nonprofit colleges and universities to answer important questions about their institution's costs and productivity. Uh, 
I'll take a stab at it. Um, you know, and I am familiar, this is the University of Delaware cost study that, that you know, um, that's conducted. I, I think part of it um, and, and that could be helpful is um, really helping our institutions understand the value and benefit uh, of, of these these kinds of uh, studies and and uh, encouraging us to participate, but we have to learn more. Um, I'm familiar because of uh, prior institution, um, but I think this could be you know really important for us. We don't collect enough information, um, mm -hmm. and we need to make uh, more data informed decisions. So this can be very useful, I think, um, uh, for our campuses. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, quite honestly, what 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 prevents us um, from sometimes moving forward is really just lack of information, but also um, oftentimes uh, uh, they're, you know, we're, we're limited resource institutions in many cases. And so trying to pick and choose um, the, 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 the things that we can participate in um, can be sometimes challenging. So if there's opportunities to, um, Look at cost, um, and and uh, perhaps even looking at our 1890 system, for example, and 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 looking at uh, an initiative that would allow the institutions to participate uh, um, at a a lower reduced cost of some kind. That that's you know those are some thoughts that I have. Very good. Uh, can I pick up on that um, oh, on the workload issue? Looking at a, a, a typical campus with enrollment between 2,500 and 5,000 students and the desire to offer the array of courses necessary to be a research two or um, even an R3 university requires a number of courses, also participation in research, and if you have a major research project and you're assigned four courses, for example, where do you find the faculty to really substitute for you um, for those additional um, research dollars or the, the courses that you would have to give up to really participate in research? And that's a challenge for us because sometimes you're challenged by accrediting institutions of having too many adjunct faculty too many part-time faculty. So really it's, it's a dilemma that small institutions face and we have to see how we can measure it, compensate for these things without jeopardizing our accreditation status. Absolutely. Uh, participants, please feel free to add your questions using the question and answer feature. But we have our second question. As the Dean at a PWI College of Veterinary Medicine, I feel strongly that our profession must do a better job of outreach to young people and to HBCU students so that they have vet med on their radar as a career option. I will be interested to hear the panelists' opinion on where the largest gaps exist in the recruitment, retention, and success of a diverse student population. Let me um, start out on that one, Felicia, because um, about five years ago, we were approached by AVMA, uh, Veterinary Medical College Association, to um, formalize linkages with 1890 universities with, with animal science programs. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where that is, but really that's where we need to start looking at these associations and, and how they can really look at the professions or the, the, the disciplines on our 1890 campuses and on HBCU campuses. V vet med uh, is perceived as harder to get into than medical school. <laughs> and the way to get around that is to ensure that these campuses have solid programs in the biological sciences, as well as in the animal sciences, so that there's a pipeline into these vet schools. And again, offering joint programs, courses, summer research opportunities for minority students, I think is a way forward in increasing the enrollment at the TWIs who have these um, veterinary schools of veterinary medicine. 
And just to, to add on to, to Mort, I, I think a um, great question. And uh, I do think that um, it's important to just reach out to our institutions. Um, we are stand ready to look at ways to uh, partner. We have a, a great relationship with the University of Georgia, our students who are uh, in the veterinary technology program here, the baccalaureate program. Um, they do a, I believe it's a five or 12 week, I can't, re don't recall, a uh, rotation. Um, and it's a great pipeline for those students who are looking at going into veterinary school. Uh, another, another, another reason why we, we started this discussion with uh, the partner institution I mentioned earlier was for this very reason, veterinary medicine, um, as they are looking at, uh, they're going through the, their general uh, assembly right now to uh, uh, start a, a medical, uh, veterinary medical school. And this would be an opportunity for us to look at partnerships. So, I mean, it, it's simple, I think, in many ways. It's, it's, it's just reaching out to our institutions and uh, exploring some, some conversation uh, uh, about how we could potentially work together. Uh, because we, we have what you need and, 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 and our students, um, and, and we have students who are, quite frankly, have been very successful in uh, veterinary school, but we have to work really hard to find sometimes the opportunities for them because of the, the, not as many partnerships that have been developed. Very yeah, good. Go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you. I was going to pick up on that from a different perspective and, and talk a little bit. First of all, I appreciate the um, reference to professional societies. I don't think we explicitly said that, but they are critical in the role of partnerships um, and building sustainable pathways across transition points in, in career. So I uh, thank you for mentioning that in, 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 in uh, specifically. I also wanted to sort of talk through the, the, the fact that there is a different strategy, and I think we've heard it a little bit here, for recruitment versus retention uh, and success in, in the workforce. And I think we have to address, we often put them together, we have to address their, the needs differently, right? So part of the reason why I, I cited some of the statistics I did at the beginning is because in terms of, you know, interest, which is loosely connected with recruitment, students do show early interest in these uh, avenues. And what we just heard from Morton Paul is the interest is there, the opportunities may not be, right? Then we find that uh, uh, HBCU graduates are going off and getting doctorates uh, and predominantly from HBCUs. And so there is an opportunity for retention. There may be, maybe there are apprenticeships that are necessary to make sure that folks have a place to go once they've gotten these early experiences or, or collegiate experiences, right? So I think the strategies necessary for recruitment, retention, and success for a workforce require different strategies. And, and we, we have to acknowledge that most students from HBCUs go on to predominantly white institutions for their doctorate degrees. Um, and those are broadly different cultural settings. Um, and when you look at say, some of the research I've done in past lives, when you look at women of color, they're more likely than other women of other um, racial backgrounds to choose STEM degrees as a major when they come into um, an institution, but then they're also more likely to change majors due to social factors right and so we have to think about like what happens after we give these students these really good experiences on the recruitment side um, and how can they we maintain a structure around them both institutionally um, and sort of hold of support for whatever the students need uh, to make sure that they're successful in the future so we have to talk about re recruitment retention and career development i think in, in different pots Oh, that's excellent. And you're absolutely correct. We do tend to lump them and they each have their own um, specific set of factors that impact. I'm sure a few of my colleagues, we could write you a story or a book about what happens to those African-American women when they go into STEM PhD programs. I know I have a book on my, in me. But, you know, to that question, I also think it's important we, we pull in that K-12 um aspect to the conversation we're, we're if if we if we lose them before they even get to college then the pipeline is not robust enough or large enough uh to um be able to to send them out so then the retention and the recruitment conversation kind of goes so there are some things i think that we need to do a better job of uh in that k-12 space and really have a hard conversation about what's expected 
at the K-12 level versus what we're expecting uh, at the higher ed level. There needs to be some curriculum mapping um, bet between the institutions or, or pathways to make sure that there's that alignment so that when students transition uh, from our institutions into vet school, um, not just from a testing standpoint, but from an expectation standpoint, they are prepared and ready in a social standpoint standpoint to be uh, successful. More um, faculty interactions. Uh, faculty are at the heart of it. There has to be someone on the ground who owns this process and having and building those relationships, I think is going to be vitally important. As Mark said, those MOUs, uh, which include support and in, in, in building in um, the pathway and the outcomes that we're looking and expected to, to achieve. We have two more questions that's come in. The first one is, what would be your vision of greater partnerships in education and research? I love the UIDP opportunities with industry. What would further engage PWIs? How might HBCUs and PWIs both benefit? Go ahead, Mark. Identifying priorities which are of importance to the industry as well as to the minority serving institution, the HBCUs. Um, sometimes industry comes in and expect us to be ready and available to them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have that expectation also that um, industry should provide funding for us and the outcomes might not be there. So it has to be mutually beneficial. Mm -hmm. And how we approach this sh should be a sustainable and activity because too often we have this one-off, what I call the one-off situation. And my hope is that the what happened after the George Floyd situation and the moment, we are not caught up in the moment where this just becomes a two to three year activity and then things wane, but there has to be sustainable partnership and where industry comes in, invest in a number of institutions, find some pathways for their um, infrastructure, our infrastructure building, as well as their workforce development, strengthening their workforce. And we can see really the mutual benefits for, for, for the parties. And one cannot expect that this is a one-way street and uh, the, the opportunities are there for sustainable partnerships. And um, in terms of UIDP, this, for most, most of us, this is our first engagement with the, the organization. So we do hope that when we meet in Atlanta at that meeting, we can forge some linkages and really form some strong, good relationships and really take um, go from there. Very good. This last question is, is a really important question with everything that has been going on uh, in the world, the tensions, the pandemic, the bomb threats, just the civil unrest. Um, it talks about how are the 1890s considering the mental health and well being of your students, faculty, and staff? Do you have any promising practices? You know, what I can say is, you know, and I don't know that I would say promising practices, but what I will say is that um, these last two years, um, almost three uh, years, we've seen a significant increase in mental health issues on our campus. Um, those issues primarily with students, but I would say um, there have been challenges even among our uh, employees as well as they have tried to navigate uh, these last few years. Um, there's been increase. Uh, one of the things that has been maybe promising for us is that we've taken on this issue as a university system. Mm -hmm. And there's been important investments that have been made to all 26 inst institutions to further develop our mental health programs. Um, everything from doing important assessments 
um, to find out where we are and what kinds of things, because in many ways, this is new. The issues may not be new, but we probably always had mental health issues. But I think our, our students are, are coming forward in ways that we never saw before. Mm -hmm. um, the pandemic even helped us on one. We were concerned that when we moved into this sort of virtual environment, that students would not take advantage of the telehealth uh, that we were offering. Actually, our numbers surged, and I can tell you it's here to stay because mm -hmm. our students perhaps, um, you know, they can, um, um, they feel more comfortable reaching out in this, in this space. And so we, we, and we have much more support available to them than we ever have. They can actually choose their own counselor as opposed to in the past, you know, whoever was up and ready to go. So I think there have been some important investments made in, in our system. And um, it is, I think helped our institution, but the issues are still there. <laughs> and um, I think we, we, are, we, are, we are having to do much more in the area of outreach. Um, to make sure we're staying on top of this. I mean, I came in today and very, the very first issue that face, I faced this, this morning was uh, uh, um, a, a attempted suicide issue among um, a student. And, and, and those are heart-wrenching when you think about, you know, our young people and, um, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening in their lives today. Today, imagine us being 18 again, or 18 to 25, and going through what they've gone through in terms of this this pandemic. And I like to call them two pandemics. Um, so, um, again, I don't know that we have anything that would necessarily be um, earth shattering in this space. But needless to say, it is an issue I think all of us are grappling with. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Nave, you probably are. Uh, can speak to that as well. Oh, absolutely. I think this semester we've had um, the most cases um, in terms of not just suicide, but needing to have evaluations and students being um, placed into assisted facilities. So much stuff is going on at home uh, in their communities. I was walking through uh, our math and science building on yesterday and one of the teachers were talking um, with the students because we had a local 15 year old jump off a bridge um, and they're seeing these things on TV amongst you know these influencers and and then they're mimicking what they're doing and you know I don't know that my my faculty, um, they're giving it their best effort, but they're not really equipped. That's not their training. That's not their background. So making sure that we provide them with the support um, that they need and continue to provide our students with the support, uh, doing some de-stressors, massages, um, real talk sessions, painting with a twist, expanding our counseling and mental uh, health services. The telehealth has not taken off as much in this area um, they still want to see a live human being. And so having enough uh, licensed professionals uh, is a challenge. But the one that I'll throw here, um, as we're within our last 60 seconds, that we do not talk about, um, and it's not a self-serving comment, but it, it is a true comment. Uh, I'm a new president, first time president. We don't talk about the load and the stress that this is causing on the presidents and the vice presidents, the administrators, is a lot. And um, our, our group of individuals need some support uh, as well um, because you know it's, it's a taxing, it's not a playbook. Uh, and we do um, contact and rely on each other, but this is a challenging time. And so we have to figure out how to continue to support each other. Uh, thank the panel uh, for being such gracious and uh, wonderful colleagues to have a dynamic dialogue. I'm going to turn it back over to Nikita. Yes, um, and I would like to thank our speaker, moderator, and panelists, and a special thanks to the audience for attending APLU's 2022 Black History Month celebration. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.